Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, heroes and villains. I'm your host, Deshaun Fauntleroy. I know your time is precious, so we're going to get right into today's show. In today's show, the big idea is Corey Gilday. But before I get into him and this outstanding guest that I have coming on, I really want to appreciate everyone that's listening to the show. And if you're listening to me now, this is we're coming up on our 50th episode. And I know why you're still here. You're here because there's no hijinks no shenanigans or boring dry ass presentations now as i said before the big idea today is coach Corey gilday of he's the owner of gilday sport conditioning this man has been in the strength and conditioning and sports performance field for over 14 years he's worked with athletes from local high schools to the nfl major league baseball nhl and nba stars such as shaquille o'neal sean Botterford, and slade norris He's also had the the opportunity to train and prepare USAF Special Forces Operation Soldiers of the 125th Special Tactics Squadron for the past two years. Now, I'm telling I got a real dog coming on. I'm going to let him out the cage. But before I go further, he has a master's degree in exercise science. Certified strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. A Russian kettlebell level one coach, Nike spark coach, a USATF level one track and field coach, a USAW level one sports performance coach. I mean, you're hearing it here first. I got a real guy coming on that's going to give you some real information on the show today. I'm front loading the show because we have a lot to cover. We're going to be covering sport coaches versus performance coaches and the differences. We'll get into sports specific training, dynamic correspondence and carryover. The importance of in season strength and conditioning. Thoughts and research on static stretching and the programming differences for youth, middle school and high school athletes. So without further ado, I want to bring Coach Corey Gilday on to the show. Coach, what have you been up to lately? I, I know you've made some adjustments to your to your gym over there in Vancouver. How's your day going? Good. I'm just uh, just working my uh, working my system. Uh, getting you know, pro- obviously the summertime is a really busy time for me. Working with high school athletes, getting get to, put, uh, to put on like high school football, but obviously <laughs> working with volleyball and. In, you know, we're doing phase one of basketball right now with people. I have a couple NFL guys, CFL guys are trying to get ready for um, camps and or uh, tryouts. So kind of a kind of a uh, mixed pot of everything going on right now. Yeah, I know you stay really busy, man. It's been a while since we connected. I think it's probably been about two years. I remember interviewing you on camera, you know, uh, for Pro Force Athletics. I'll have to put that link into the show. There was actually two parts to that. And I thought that was uh, that was that was a real good conversation for the both of us. I thought it was kind of funny because I, uh, I put the House of Cards soundtrack on one of those. You know, um, a lot of people appreciated that, but I could see you're busy, man. I know in a prior conversation, we wanted to uh, we were discussing sport coaches versus performance coaches and the differences. So I wanted to get your thoughts with that and go into a little more detail and understand it from your perspective. Well, you know, constantly whenever I have parents or coaches come in with athletes, they are trying to tell us how they want to drill run or my coach says I should do it like this. And in nine times out of 10, that coach's recommendation or want is incorrect for proper sport carryover. And it's, you know, we always talk about staying in our lane when it comes to performance training, when it comes to, um, when we, we don't we don't coach kids to catch footballs, we don't coach kids to hit baseballs, we don't coach kids to hit a volleyball. We merely train the engine that allows them to do it quicker, faster, stronger, with less injury. It's the coach's job to teach the technique. Now we do some integrated carryover to make sure that we have the most amount of carryover when it comes to the field when we do drills. But some coaches are just in love with certain drills because they think uh, it's going to carry over the field faster. 
perfect example are speed ladders. I use speed ladders. I know you use speed ladders, but they're probably the most overused tool I see out there. I see people do speed ladders all day long, and I'm like, what are we doing? Why are we doing all these drills? It does not correlate to quote unquote fast feet, and that's not the, that's not the mechanics we're using on the field. You know, we're not staying that narrow. We're you know, we want proper shin angle both in multi-directional linear planes to change direction. Yes, we're going moving fast. I think it's I think speed ladders are a phenomenal tool for warm up to get people used to get to moving fast, but as far as carryover, not there. I have a phenomenal assistant, uh, Coach Andrew Pompey, formerly of Portland State. He has been my right hand man since March when he he came on. And we had this conversation with another coach talking about all these coaches want choppy steps in the drill on these cone drills, but it doesn't teach proper sports performance movement. It just doesn't. You know, I'd rather teach you proper loading and unloading out of a, out of a cut the right way. But, you know, sometimes we kind of get bullied by sport coaches or parents because parents want to see what the sport coaches do. So, and, they, you know, obviously they pay our paychecks. So sometimes we change stuff. So I just wish that sport coaches would understand, hey, you teach the sport, we'll teach the, the performance aspect and we can all, we can all, everyone can get better. You know, I, I agree with you with the part about the ladders. I, I almost never use ladders. You know, the only time I might use ladders, it might be on Thanksgiving, Christmas or New Year's when I do uh, special trainings and we're doing some type of game or competition or relay race. And the reason why I can say that with 100 percent confidence is that I've never found any literature through the uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association or through the American College of Sports Medicine or or, or any other. Other uh, journal of exercise that says that using ladders will help you get faster and create more force production for linear sprint training or even um, lateral sprint work. So, uh, you know, I, I agree with it, it looks fancy. It looks cool. But where does it really get you? Yeah. You know, so I can agree with you 100 percent on that note. And a shout out to Coach Pompey. I've met him a few times, man. I, re- I can really appreciate him. I mean, I, I would say maybe for younger kids, the speed letter has a greater just for variable movement. But as we get older, when it starts to look really fancy, it doesn't, I don't think it really matters. We've all seen the videos of like, I think it's a gentleman running speed ladders and quick feet in the sand. He looks really fast. And I, I bet you that guy freaking bags groceries during the day. He doesn't play in the league. Looks awesome, but it doesn't mean anything. And he probably couldn't get off a, a jam for a high end from a high end cornerback and get up field and run a quick, quick slant yeah. and catch a ball coming at 60, 70 or 80 miles an hour. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't care. I mean, so I, I do. I do agree with you about the latter, especially when you're talking about like uh, youth athletes just developing foot and eye coordination. Yeah, I think it has a place for those kids. Yeah, it's a phenomenal tool for that. Um, another thing with ladders too is, you know me, I'm all about. I want neural fatigue is a big part of training with me, and people under, wonder why I don't do longer set drills, and I'm like, I want my neural competency and my coordination to be up there at the highest level at all times. And I want to start building the volume to there. I'd rather have 100 great micro reps than 50 kind of crappy longer reps. I'd rather just shorten it up and give more reps. You know, these, I see these ladders that are 15 feet long and I'm like, Oh God, my, my ladders are five feet long. Right. You know, if, if that, so it's, it's quick and out, quick and out. So yeah, def- definitely. If you're going to use them and you're training football athletes, Average play is going to last four to six seconds. You can argue five to seven, but you're in and out of the ladder in that amount of time. You know, you, one of those things, too, talking about sport coaches and performance coaches staying in the lane. Um, a great example, Coach Charlie Strong got to Texas. And I knew he was just going to be a disaster when it happened. You know, when he got, I think he went to, he came in and he goes, we're no longer going to run all these quick plyometrics and explosive lifts. We're, uh, we're going to lift super heavy and we're going to run the mile because I want my guy strong and have good endurance. I'm like, and I, I saw that quote and I'm going, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, that's, and I, and, and I believe the UT, I, I felt so bad for the UT strength coach. I don't even know who it was at the time that had to deal with that. They had to like come up to with a division one coach and go that you're wrong. That's not, if you want that, that's not how we're going to accomplish that. Right. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I really, you know, one of uh, I'm talking about coaches that really get along well with strength coaches is one of Chip Kelly's amazing things. That I don't think people realize is that Chip Kelly sat down with 
James Ratcliffe, and they would sit down and develop a practice plan for the year together. And what kind of load, how are you going to integrate stuff, what drill, here's, you know, Chip says, here's what I want, here's what, here's the expectations out of this offense and out of this defense, here's what I want, I need you to train it accordingly. And James Ratcliffe went upon a part of the plan to develop that, you know, with that linear-based sports medicine model. That's an appropriate model. A lot of programs have what's called a vertically loaded. You know, sport coach says this, athletic training program says this, the orthopedic said this, and then the strength coaches put their piece in and it kind of hopefully comes out. With the linear-based model a horizontal, or horizontally-based model, everyone's working together to get the outcome. Not, not, it's, not the sum of them, you know, so everyone's working together on a program. That's where it's appropriate, you know. It's when you're constantly fighting against what people are doing. I was at a conference a few years ago, and Coach Brian Miller, who's a really awesome strength coach, I believe he's, I want to say he's at Nebraska now or somewhere else, um, he was telling me that they would, uh, he was at Oregon State at the time, would would have a certain load on their training, and you know, kids would come in and they say, hey, we're, we're, we're exhausted, we can't do this workout. It's like, why not? Well, our coach made us run wind sprints when it wasn't part of the practice plan, and it just mm-hmm. wrecked their entire programming. So it's one of those things where if you want to be a sport coach, coach the sport. When you have qualified strength and conditioning professionals in your quiver, use your arrow. Don't don't think you know better than the person who does this for a living. You know, I, I agree with you 100 percent about uh, sport coaches and performance coaches being on the same page. And one thing I think the sport coaches forget about is just really understanding the energy systems and understanding yeah. all three energy systems and, you know, training accordingly and realizing that if you do all these wind sprints or a whole bunch of cardio, it's going to affect them in the weight room later on in terms of what we might have had planned. So I think communication is very important, but also like the knowledge and just, you know, doing the reading and studying on both sides. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, and there's no, pro- there's no problem with a, with you as a strength and conditioning coach working with your sport coaches and maybe giving them some educational pieces that they, so they can start speaking your language, you know, not to be arrogant at all, but you know, you, you both, you and I have both coached football at a high level as position stuff. So uh, we feel confident where we could coach the sport of football or I could coach baseball or ski racing sports that I've played. Yes, I, I know you've coached and you've played at a high level. I, I know you've played some indoor. I know you. It sounds like you've had some AFL or CFL tryouts. I've done the yeah. indoor thing, you know, for sure. So, but we could coach at that level and feel confident we do a good job. At the same time, we know we were, we're, we're trained performance coaches. We've spent a lot of time on education and and money and conferences and stuff like that. So we could do stuff, but that doesn't mean that the the fo- football coaches coach for 20 years that, you know, has 20 years of weight room experience doing things the wrong way has our experience. But, you know, I always tell performance coaches, you have to tread lightly. You know, you have to, this is from, uh, I used to work with Josh Hunt from Twist Conditioning, by the way, another phenomenal place. And we used to talk about uh, lessons that I learned in corporate fitness is sometimes you have to give the people a gift of what they need in a in package inside of a box of what they want. Most definitely. So, you know, sometimes you have to give exercises or the appearance of what the coach asked for and you're trying to slide in what they really need. Because, you know, in the collegiate setting, pro setting, you got to keep your job. Your, your, your moral compass and your program integrity only go so far if you're sitting on the street not training anyone. It doesn't help anyone. <laughs> right, right. I get it. I'm laughing, but it's not funny. No, it's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I own my own facility is because you can't, you know, if you don't want to train with me, fine. This is what I, this is what I offer and I show results. But, you know, trying to work with coaches and what we're doing is, uh, is sometimes a hard thing. Like they, they're so stuck in their ways of this is how we've always done it, you know. I know you've worked in corporate fitness too. And just remember that, that that guy you walk over to lap pull down and you tell them they're doing it wrong and they say they've been doing it for 25 years might also be a high school football coach with the same mentality when it comes to how they work with their team. So we have to be cognizant of how we, we work with sport coaches. It's better to try to educate them. And, you know, I'm trying to do coaches clinics and teach them about proper, you know, proper conditioning and the importance of it and give them literature to understand stuff. At the same time, I want to make sure that they don't just because they read an article on stretching or training that now they're not, they're not an expert. <laughs> right. 
Oh. You know, I wanted to switch lanes, uh, Coach, and I know we were talking about the latter earlier, and that might get incorporated into this, but I want to hear your thoughts on sports-specific training. In the NSCA literature, they talk about dynamic correspondence and carryover and how some of these words get twisted from the original meanings, especially from the Eastern European bloc. So talk to me about sports-specific training and carryover. You know, so when we're doing sports specific training, we we gotta look at a couple different phases. So, you know, we we wanna have a basic level of strength, relative strength, and then our sports strength. And we're constantly, you know, like coaches constantly looking for the carryover, how are we gonna make my football player better or or my ballet dancer better? And when we're talking about like sports specific exercise, it depends where my athlete is in their training age. If I have someone who's never lifted before, I don't care if they're an NFL football player. Their workouts may look like a 13-year-old who first walked in the weight room as far as exercise selection. Now, the likelihood of an NFL football player never lifting weights before is very unlikely, but you get my understanding. You, you have to learn to frame before you build, for, before you put the walls up. You know, I see, I think you remember this a few years ago when Nike had Adrian Peterson pulling like 12 speech parachutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Epidemic of these parents buying all these extra speed shoots with kids and they're running with speed shoots and they're running with horrible form, obviously have zero strength, relative strength in their bodies. So running with a shoot doesn't do anything. There's no carryover because it's not doing anything. So when I'm looking for sports specific carryover, it needs to be in, in part of a program. You know, we're looking for transfer. You know, they always say the front squats more superior than a back squat is to sports performance because of the loading is more towards the front part of your foot or knee dominant and, and whatnot. Yes. But I think that we, we will get in patterns in a sport where the back squat will help us, you know, greater neural drive, things like that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't program back squat. It just means the volume of front squats may be higher than they are in back squats or single leg Bulgarian versions are, are going to be in there. You know, I really want my athletes, whether they're a soccer girl, soccer player or a um, high school NFL football player, all, no matter who you are, before the volume of sports specific activities, I, you know, i.e. medicine ball tosses to one leg or or multi-directional jump heightens and or whatnot that really have high carryover. You know, I want all my athletes relative to who they are to be able to pull off the ground, deadlift one and a half to two times their body weight, squat one and a half to two times their body weight, and get close to bench pressing their body weight and doing at least eight to ten body weight pull-ups. I want that type of strength out of all my athletes before we start getting crazy into going specifically into sports specific stuff on the other end um there's a great story i think you and i have talked told the story a few times where uh uh running back dave meggett from the 80s uh, i remember him yeah so uh mel Sif, I was super training mel Sif, but uh uh alver meal alver meal from uh at the time of the giant, he I think it was the Giants and Eagles, and he I think Dave Meg at the time at, at the body weight of one eighty five had squatted five eighty five, which is amazing. And Al Vermeil, he's a strength coach. I I, I want to say we're familiar with him at the clinic where he has that pyramid model. At, yes, exactly. Yes, he has he's that. a lot. I, I I like his style, and I usually start with there with the symmetry and balance at the bottom. Exactly. Uh, but so. Someone goes, so is that a big, is that a good enough squat? And 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 Al goes, I believe it's they're talking to strength coaches and goes, that's good enough. We don't need to, we don't need to focus on getting stronger anymore. You know, so for Al thought, okay, five eighty five. There's no the focus should be on sports specific at that point. There's no there's no really point in adding given working on getting any stronger. He should kind of maintain that general strength that he has now and build off of that. I think the mistake coaches make with youth athletes and high school athletes is. We don't make them as strong. We don't, you know, basically make them as strong, as flexible, as pliable. You know, teach kids about proper tissue quality. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Bill Lasseur of Flexibility Pros. He's an amazing body worker in Arizona. He's constantly talking about muscles won't tear if they're pli- if they're if they got good pliability. So teach kids about and parents about, you know, massages are massage is important. Self massage is important with foam rolling with IASTM with your self scrapers, teach them how to take care of themselves, 
Teach them how to stretch appropriately. If you if your tissues are in proper zone, you're not going to get hurt, or the injury is going to go way down. So we teach basics to kids so that they get to that relative level of strength, and then we can get sports specific, and it comes really easily. I see these sport performance coaches really struggling to teach these cool exercises that look sexy on the on film that they can do because they're strong. And they're trying to teach it to a twelve year old and it looks like garbage because they don't have strength to do that. Right. Or the or or the uh muscular control to do it and yeah, coordination. So you, have, you build that stuff in the basic patterns of exercise. Uh, it's the point and and I'm not saying that we're not focusing on sport a lot of sports performance, sports specific exercises when we're in here. It's the it's the emphasis of what we're focusing on during training. You know, during what phase we're in. If we if we've gone through the relative strength and we hit these those benchmarks, then we're going to start transferring. You know, the, the the volume of work will start going more towards higher carryover, and also the higher carryover. You know, with the uh, the uh, Anatoly Bunderchuk is always talking about spending blocks of time with your sports specific stuff, and same with basic loads to build basic patterns. Don't spend time trying to relearn stuff that doesn't have. A lot of carryover. Like you, you probably spend more time with Olympic lifting than I do. I'm spending a little bit more time now because I've Andrew to help with uh, have multiple eyes on target. Yes, you know, you know I'm more of the DeFranco model where I can develop power and total body power. And other drills that don't take as much skill acquisition because sometimes I don't have the time to teach the skill skill acquisition. So. It's just a pain on, and I'm not saying cleans are, cleans are amazing. Olympic lifting, Olympic lifting is amazing, but sometimes I don't. I want to spend more time on other on other aspects of training, and that's just my preference. Yeah, you know, and you know what's interesting about that man is, as I'm fortunate enough to have an outstanding intern and um, a future coach with Trevor Sackman, who intern at uh, University of Oregon with uh, Coach Radcliffe. So a lot of what you, you do see that, but there's like what we were discussing earlier, there's a lot that you don't see. And what I mean by that is we literally have like a 40 to 45 minute warm up. I mean, we might train for 90 minutes and 40 of that will be part of our warm up because it's a six phase dynamic warm up mm -hmm. where we start off with jogging and then we'll go through a DNS crawling series. And then after that, we'll do the soft tissue work. From there, we'll get into some of our mobility drills. If we want to get into some static stretching at that point, we'll do it. But from there, we'll get into some hurdle mobility. And then from there, we'll go into a dynamic warm up. And then after that, we finish with some light uh, central nervous system stimulation drills like light jumps, you know, or some medicine ball slams or tosses and or some light sprints, yeah. you know, but uh, that is like taking more time in the warm up, including the soft tissue with the mobility work. I have found like I don't have any injuries. And then when these kids are going out on the field, their hamstrings are not pulling up on them. They're not twinging. The yeah. ones that aren't consistent hamstring pulls, hamstring tears all of the time because they don't take the time. And it's funny that some of the stuff that you're talking about, some sport coaches, they'll still start off with static stretching. I know. And you can't really, you know, my, my thing with static stretching is, Unless you're warmed up if you're already foam rolled and facilitated some blood in there, you're really not doing a whole lot but irritating that fascia. So it's not the old school time. I mean, like I said, I think static stretching, when it first that research came out where static stretching inhibits neurally, you know, they did the stretch, the research of, uh, right after static stretching, your, 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 your force production goes down. Well, Again, I've read the research. I've actually seen what the protocols are. They essentially put someone in a race to put them in a, a deep quad uh, stretch for like 40 seconds, like pretty uncomfortable thing, and then have them go try to do a jump. Well, my thing is if you foam roll, do static stretching, dynamic warm-up, and get re-integrated, re, re get the get everything lined back, get the myofibrils re-lined up with integrated back in, static stretching is not going to neurally inhibit you, not for your workout. But – you need to be slightly warmed up and have tissue quality ready before you start approaching statics. I think static stretching is amazing at the end. It's amazing to do when you're watching TV at home and you foam roll and work on some mobility, work on some FR, you know, uh, FRS, uh, functional range series, doing things like that. Those are when it's really viable. And or if you have some, we all have athletes. You know how I'm built. I, my, I have a 
serious upper cross because of all the benching I do. I should always stretch my chest before I do any drills so I should try to get into alignment. So you have people with corrective issues, that's fine to stretch them, but don't just do a full body stretch. It's stupid. <laughs> You know what? I want to transition, man. We talked about this before, the importance of in-season strength and conditioning. And I know this is a huge one for you, man. So let's talk about it. Okay. So, you know, all, all the time when I have people sign up or working with people, oh, train and they have season. I'm like, well, they need to train during season. It's like, well, we don't have time. I don't want to get them tired. I don't want to get them injured. I'm like, <laughs> I said, if you train hard all the way to season and you stop, you're going to start losing goal gains about two weeks in. You're going to almost be back to square one within four or five weeks. So why are we? I, I agree. You know, that's a one of the main reasons why I really adopted James Radcliffe undulating periodization model because, you know, he said we're not trying to peak these guys to be graded for September eighth against Sacramento State. We want them to be great against. Alabama in the national championship game so we can undulate and constantly get better during season two the New England Patriots strength coach had them squatting at 90% one RM two days before the Super Bowl let, let that marinate with you the NFL football players through a long at season were squatting at near 90% one RM two days before the Super Bowl yep and they'll be recovered by that Sunday yeah and it's because hours they're later. Constantly training and they're working on stuff and they're training to get better Constantly, I always tell my, one of my analogies. I don't know if you've ever heard me say this. It's like nothing in life maintains itself. A tree either grows and prospers or dies and withers away. There is no maintenance. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. You pick what you want to do. Right. You know, one thing, you know, for those coaches that might be listening right now and parents and athletes that are listening, Coach, I want you to explain the difference between linear periodization and undulating periodization for our folks out there. So traditionally, linear periodization created by Vladimir Isterin is they have blocks. So like a three-month three general preparatory phase where you work on your general conditioning and overall, just overall training, get ready for the phases. And then we'll go through basic strength, max, you know, general strength, max strength, max power, strength, endurance, whatever you want to set up. But it's set up to set up for a competition period where you're at the highest level it's a it's like over nine months exactly it's it was designed for olympic sports in mind um not for team sports it's been adopted by team sports to do it and what happens team sport coaches in the past in the 80s and 90s and 70s would just do the linear periodization and they would just do a maintenance phase doing the same exercises three times a week just to maintain general level ISO to maintain the level of decay and the performance to slow down. James Ratcliffe is essentially taking the blocks of a linear periodization and shortening the blocks and constantly rotate them so we're constant. We're not working on power just once, one time in the once or twice in a year period. We're working on six or seven times. We have strength blocks. But we're constantly, we're not spending too much time as to overload the nervous system and create overtraining or fatigue or some, we want to get to overreaching, but not to overtraining. And then we yes. can constantly recover. So we can constantly get better through the season that way. I love this. I love that system too for high school athletes because kids come in in January, they want to train hard for football. Sometimes they have other sport comp, uh, obligations come up, whatever comes up and it's just a matter, you know, they, I constantly want to do this so they can constantly get different phases and characteristics in throughout the year. So we're constantly getting, they're adapting to different types of stimulus. And I just, you know, if you do basic linear period block periodization, sometimes you're only getting the, the GPP model or you're only getting a hypertrophy phase when you haven't got the other stuff involved. And it allows me to intake athletes at different parts of the year very easily because I'm constantly working through that. I like that, man. Um, I think we have a lot of similarities going on because the training or or I, I, I guess I would say the, the methodologies that I use are generally somewhere between um, Kyle Dietz triphasic training and the West Side Barbell system, yeah. you know, and I know uh, you Mike Boyle fanatics out there. I have a, a lot of Mike Boyle's material. We get a lot of single limb movements in every single day. It's just we show you what we want to show you yeah. you know but believe that that's being done yeah mike boyle you know this mike boyle is a uh 
is definitely a mentor and I trade him on a lot of stuff. I love how he does his business. I love how he does his training. How he explains stuff is is I think phenomenal. It's always one of the very first books I recommend to in my interns is to read his advances and in, in functional training and his new and his new model as well. It's a phenomenal book to understand uh, how to actually be a performance coach, you know. Yeah, that new functional training yeah, for sports. Yeah, that yeah, other try basic stuff is amazing. A great great way to set up workouts. I like pieces of uh, West Side Barbell's conjugate method. All the research and from lifters, I said, and I and I have the tremendous amount of respect for Louis Simmons. But what I found is the pure West Side methodology doesn't work very well for non geared lifters. True. I mean, True. I'm using I, I and you using know I've obviously board. adjusted it. Yeah, I'm using geared in both definitions of what I mean by that. You guys take that what you want with that, but. You know, because I don't think you can max effort your lifts two times a week consistently and not experience neural overload unless you're getting some type of aid. So certainly, you know, unless you're a freak. And then, (laughs) you know, so I know that when I lift heavy long term, eventually my body goes, hey, let's go do some yoga. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, like Alan Cosgrove is always talks about like, if you like it, steal it. There's nothing proprietary in this business and it shouldn't be. We're trying to always get kids better. You know, especially me, I'm just trying to get kids better. Right. You know, I have my system and I used to, as a younger coach, I'd grab, I'd I'd go to a conference and I'd change everything I do. I don't change stuff anymore because I have a way I want to do stuff. I'll see different modalities. Like, Oh, try that. I think I I like that fits my model, but you got to figure out what works for your methodology and your personality. Every coach has different personalities and coaches need to be aware of that. It's like, figure out what works for your personality. You know, you need to be something that really fits you. I'm also a huge Bosch guy, you know, teaching about if uh, you want to learn how to get kids, kids faster, read the book running. Yeah. You know, I have that. We've talked about that several times, man. And I, I bought his whole DVD series too. Uh, I found that to be very good. He used a lot of his concepts with Julia Shellmeyer on his journey to the unit between um, Grant high school, Southern Oregon and university of Oregon, man, you know, um, Tell the people his book again, Corey. It's running by uh, Franz Bosch, and it's um, don't buy it thinking it's about long distance running. It has nothing to do with long distance running. <laughs> it's all about sprinting, and he'll go through the physiology of talking about linear subsystems and stiffness. You know, one of his biggest biggest takeaways is trying to teach your body to be stiff on the drive leg and very fluid and relaxed on the as you as you're, as you're preparing the, the preparatory leg. And teaching that, you know, how to be stiff and fluid at the same time. And, you know, there are different ways to train sprinters than there are trained football players. So, you know, he yes. he modifies some of the squats and stuff like that. But you can use that as you get closer to season for football players. They don't need to go deep squat right before season. You know, you can maybe work on explosion and, and work and use those exercises to maximize force production with those guys. There's There's nothing wrong with using pieces of that. There's no not, – Not at all. I tell people the worst thing in, our, in the exercise science field is, is dogmatism. If you're, if you're a dogmatic type person on a certain program, I don't want to deal with you because you won't keep your mind open. I want a pragmatic. The pragmatic approach where we're constantly working on trying new things, open to different ideas. Yes. What's going to work, you know? I trained Shaquille O'Neal in 2003. The program he did at the time was based off of my best, most of the, the, the science available to me. I have the file still, and I look at it and go, what the hell was I doing? <laughs> I'm laughing because I've been there too. And sometimes I feel guilty, you know, for those athletes, but that's the importance of learning and getting better. I'm like, man, I wish I could have trained you with these methodologies that I know now, yeah. even with uh N- Nisha Bomahim, I did uh, some sprint work with him when he was re- recovering from uh, his shoulder injury after being released from the, uh, the saints after a few seasons. And he was making another run. And I'm like, where I'm at now, I'm like, damn, I wish I would have knew this stuff then but i had the most available material out there so i know exactly what you mean man yeah it's not that he didn't get results and i got but i it's like i could have done so much more right so i mean you you know my i think the final thing you, you take away is constantly evolve as a coach you know and and find what methodology works for you you know i have 
I have I've been a boil guy for a long time as far as how I set stuff up and how I approach stuff and how my workouts look a lot like it, like the the organize workout organization because it works for my business model too. So, you know, I wanted to ask you, man. What what are some of your thoughts on programming differences for youth, middle school, and high school athletes? Okay, so you know, since I know we're running out of time, but um, the uh, the biggest issue is youth athletes are not pro little mini pro athletes. Say that one more time, Coach. I said youth athletes are not little mini pro athletes, so don't treat them like that. You know. You know, it comes back to we talked about the Adrian Peterson one with 12 parachutes and then seeing a 12-year-old one with 12 parachutes. You need to program based of what they need. Um, if you don't know how to train youth athletes, great book, Building Youth Champions by Dr. Joseph Drabeck. Read it. It'll teach you what kind of skills they can a- acquisition at. I start training at 8 years old. My 8-year-olds don't touch a weight besides a medicine ball for nearly five weeks. They have PVC pipes. And medicine balls, foam rollers, and body weight. Exactly. And they learn how to move. And they, a lot of it's game. You know, sometimes we do a lot of competition stuff about having games. You know, you know what? Before you go further, man, you see a, two of my older athletes, Logan Wilson and and Gabe Hambrick. Like those dudes. I got one in the middle of seventh grade and one at the end of his eighth grade year. They're at the end of their freshman and sophomore years now, but they literally started for months with me with PVC pipes. And now you're seeing the the effects of the progression of me taking them with the PVC pipe to a 15 pound training bar to a 30 pound training bar to the 45 pound training yeah. bar and adding fives and tens. And now they're cleaning real well. Like next year, we're going to compete. We're going to a competition where yeah, we're going to I do tell, some Olympic tell, weightlifting. You know, I tell the, and that's the thing I tell parents, I don't train your eight year old or 10 year old to be better as 11 year old. That's not my, that's not my, I'm not interested in it. If that's your interest, then I don't, don't train with me because I'm all about long-term athletic development. Yes. If you're coming eight or nine years old, my goal is to make you the best junior or senior in high school because, you know, obviously the, the step one of that is I want to go to the next level beyond high school because I want to get good at high school sports or whatever sports that that you're in. Okay. Awesome. But I don't want to, I want to slow cook it. You know, Mark McLaughlin used to talk about slow cooking, especially the cardiovascular system of that cage. You shouldn't be running intervals with young kids, build their, build their cardiac muscle correctly. Don't have them hard. you know, you, you understand that if you run intervals as a young kid, like you're going to actually, Hinder their cardiovac- cardiovascular development for the rest of their life just to get better cardiac output for their upcoming new soccer season. That, to me, is criminal. Understand how physiology works or don't play the game. You know, uh, we're getting into the, to the two-minute quarter. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, man, uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give to sport coaches and strength coaches? Talk to each other. Talk to each other. Tell them, performance coaches, don't have an ego about how much knowledge you have. And sport coaches, don't think that you're the be-all, end-all because you're a decision maker. You need to, you know, it's all about getting the kids better. And, you know, we don't, we don't think we can write a legal brief because we're not lawyers. But somehow sports performance coach, sport coaches think they can do this. You know, we're not trying to take people's job. Let's do, let's let everyone do their job so everyone can get better. Yes. Um, two, just have that line of communication always open. Two book recommendations, Coach. Two book recommendations for um, Conscious Coaching by uh, Brett Bartholomew. It just came out. It's an amazing book. I'm trying to get him on the show, man. I, I reached out to him. I haven't heard back from him yet, but just know that I'm out there. You yeah. know, if Corey knows this guy, and I'm telling you, I reached out to him. He might not call back. They might not get back to me. But when you're trying to get somewhere, you have to knock to see if that door will be open and take a yeah, chance. Definitely. Um, and. I always recommend this book. So it's advances in functional training, the new uh, Mike Boyle 2.0 book. If you haven't read it, read it. If you're a new coach, read it. It's, it'll really enlighten you on how to kind of run your, run your programs. 
Yes, I'll, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to put all these books in the show notes, too. And I'll did you have any PDFs that that you might want to send that I can attach to this or free giveaways? You know, where and then before we close out, where can people find you at, man? Where are you at? Tell us about your gym and so what you have going on. Find us at uh, www.gildaysport.com. We're in Vancouver across the street from Planet Not So Fitness um, off of... <laughs> We're on Mill Plain. Um, we're in the 70, 7588 Delaware Lane, Vancouver, Washington, 98664. We have 6,000 square feet. We have 3,000 square feet of turf. We have a 2,000 square foot strength and conditioning area with turf as well. Um, we also have a chiropractic office. We're working for just for the health of it with Dr. Kara Olson. Um, we just signed an exclusive deal with Air One Football Academy, so we're running Air One Football as well. Um we work with the Washington Timbers and up, so we've got a lot of stuff going on and constantly um, we're always taking clients and athletes to come on in and try it out. So nice. I, I know one of the things that I can appreciate where you're going with your business is I know you're doing like clinics and seminars and certifications. I know you did like the Lee Tav uh, speed, speed, agility, quickness certification. Am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah multi-directional certification. Yeah. MBS. Yes. Well, you heard it here first um, with Coach Corey Gilday. I appreciate y'all listening. Stay tuned for more great guests. And I'm sure this gentleman, he's going to think of some a whole bunch of stuff that he didn't say. So look for him to come on again in the next 10 to 12 weeks. My role is to help student athletes develop the mental skills for success in sports, which carry over to their life as well. I work with normal people who are under additional perceived pressures to perform in their sport. My goals are to teach student athletes how to be more confident, focus better, stay composed under pressure, practice more efficiently and develop more effective pregame routines. I become an, I become an extension of the athlete's support team. Unlike a psychotherapist or psychologist, I do not use couches, prescribe medicines, or work with abnormal behavior. The main difference between my sports mastery program and a psychotherapist is that I work with athletes on sports performance enhancement. I tend not to get into personal challenges such as divorce, breakups, grief counseling, or abnormal behavior. Although those areas of life do affect sports performance, when need be, they are addressed. My philosophy is that you cannot separate the mental from the physical when it comes to performance. After all, decisions, thoughts, images, and feelings drive motor behavior. So how do you know when you need or can benefit from my sports mastery program? My goal is to help the student athlete identify barriers to hard work, identify barriers to teamwork, and enhance sports performance by improving mental skills for success. Do you have any doubts about your sport before or during competition? Do you get so anxious that you don't have a calm mind or think straight in competition? Come easily frustrated when things do not go according to plan. So when you consider these questions, the next obvious question is this. When is my sports mastery program needed? You don't perform well when others are watching you. The sports mastery program is needed when... You maintain doubt about your sport before or during games. You feel anxious or scared when you perform in competition. So how can the student athlete benefit from the Sports Mastery Coaching Program? They will have improved focus and the ability to concentrate and manage distractions. Develop systems and strategies to increase confidence and eliminate doubts and fears. Develop coping skills to deal with setbacks and errors. Find the right zone of intensity for their sport. The student athlete will also learn to develop and enhance communication skills. The student athlete will benefit by learning to develop a healthy belief system and identify irrational thoughts. The student athlete would also benefit when they learn to improve and balance motivation for optimal performance, develop confidence post injury. The student athlete will benefit from my sports mastery program by learning to identify and enter the zone more often. At the end of the day, my sports mastery program does not apply to a wide variety of athletes. 
This program is for the serious athletes only. Most of my student athletes are in junior high, high school, and college. However, they are highly committed to excellence in seeing how far they can go in their sports. My sports mastery program is not something they need, it's something that they want. These student athletes love competition and testing themselves against the best in their sport. They understand the importance of positive attitude and mental toughness. These student athletes want every possible advantage they can get, including the mental edge over competition. The first thing we do is identify the student athletes hopes and dreams, pains and fears and barriers and limitations. This serves as a guideline and helps the student athlete to think about mindset. When we first meet in person or virtually, I ask more questions about mindset and beliefs based on assessment results so we can develop a complete picture of your mental game. Once the game plan is developed, we will begin our work on mental skills that apply to your current and specific challenges. I present a sports mastery program that is customized to the athlete's individual needs. I always include the core foundation mental skills for all of my athletes. We apply the sports mastery concepts and skills to practice, pre-performance preparation, warm-up routines, and post-performance assessments. The next step is to decide if my sports mastery program is something you want. Not everyone wants to take the time to learn about mindset and how it affects an individual sports performance. I can tell you by participating in my sports mastery program, you'll set yourself apart from other student athletes. I help the student athlete transform, shake their limiting beliefs, silence monkey mind chatter, and equip them with the tools to succeed. Sports mastery will provide you with the tools to maximize your game in competition and in the classroom. To learn more, visit sportsmastery.com coaching.